Have you ever taken a look at a modern sewing machine and wondered what do all these symbols, buttons, dials, knobs mean? Why is there a second bobbin with thread that I have to wind? What does worrying about tension and stitch length and stitch type all mean? Why does it seem so complicated? At least for me, when I was starting out sewing again, I was really intimidated by how many settings I had to know. It felt like I had to learn so much just to get started and it really prevented me from getting into sewing much sooner than I would have otherwise because I just felt like I didn't know enough to make something half decent. So a few months ago, I was browsing some antique listings online, as one does, <laughs> and I found a beautiful antique sewing machine. And so I wanted to compare how this slightly simpler antique sewing machine holds up against a modern sewing machine. I want to caveat this and say these are my personal opinions. I am far from a professional sewer or anything like that, so I don't really know what I'm talking about. This is just for my own personal preferences and my own personal uses. I wanted to see maybe which one would win out. The Brother CE1125PRW Project Runway Limited Edition Modern Sewing Machine or my Wilcox and Gibbs Twisted Chain Stitch Sewing Machine from about 1894 or 1895. I have about 12 categories that I'm going to be comparing them on, giving them points in, and I'm very curious to see which one will win at the end. So the first way I wanted to compare these machines is the time that it takes to thread both of them up right before threading the thread through the needle. I have quite a hard time, it's very hit or miss for me to put the thread through the needle, so I thought it would be the most fair to kind of stop at that point because that is all the other steps that are required in order to thread this machine. As you can see on the modern machine, I actually have to thread the bobbin on first and wind up the bobbin. I didn't end up winding up the bobbin fully, I just rounded up enough so that I could use it. And then after winding up the bobbin, I had to fully thread the machine for the top needle portion. On the other hand, my antique machine only works with one thread. There is no bobbin to this machine because it is a twisted chain stitch machine. I'll get into later the pros and cons of exactly a lock stitch, which is the modern sewing machine, and the chain stitch sewing machine that the antique machine uses. But as you can see, the antique sewing machine is much faster to thread, even though some bits are fiddly, just because I only have to thread the top portion of the machine and I don't have to worry about a bobbin. Personally, I would say between the two, I highly prefer threading the antique machine because I don't have to worry about threading a bobbin and at some point later accidentally running out of bobbin thread. So I'm going to give the antique machine the one point on this and none to the modern sewing machine. The second point where I want to compare these two machines is the settings that you can use for the machine, specifically the stitch length and the tension. Now for the antique machine, the stitch length is set by a dial that's underneath the cloth plate. It has a pretty good tension to it, so while you can move it easily, I can't accidentally knock it and change it. Whereas the modern machine has basically an electronic interface where I can either set it wider or skinnier. But I honestly would say that they're both very even. They're easy to set, easy to understand what it is. The second point, and that's the point that I think I struggle most with, is tension. On modern machines, tensions are usually some sort of knob and you have to make sure that your upper tension matches with your bobbin tension. In my machine, I can't change the bobbin tension. You have to think about your fabric type and your stitch length and exactly what kind of stitches you're doing. And I always get it wrong and I always have to test my fabric a few times and my thread, exactly what tension it needs. And this is such a headache and I've created so many knots. It's really frustrating to be honest. I it's easy to set, but I never know what to set it at. So that was one of my biggest gripes with modern machines. I think this is one of the most intimidating sets for me is setting the correct tension. If you have any tips, please let me know. But I will say the antique machine, this is called the automatic tension machine. And when Wilcox and Gibbs first produced their machines, they used a glass tensioner knob that you had to adjust. But after about the 1870s, they actually created this new mechanism, which is the automatic tensioner. and depending on what fabric you're using, what thread you're using, how fast you're going, your stitch length, it will automatically choose the exact right tension for you. Mechanically, you don't have to touch anything, it's just done. And that to me is a huge win. I love that, it's so easy, I'm not thinking about it. And I would have to say that I'm going to have to give a point to the antique machine over the modern machine on just machine settings because it's literally so easy. You only set the stitch length and tension is done for you. It's really nice. 
so far, the antique machine I think is winning quite a bit in all of the categories, but this next category is gathering. And for this example, I wanted to gather a 10 inch scrap of fabric down to five. <sighs> With the antique machine, because it is a chain stitch, you can't change the layout of your fabric after you've sewn it. So with a modern machine, you can make wide stitches and then pull your fabric together. But with chain stitching, that doesn't work. So you have to gather it as you're sewing it, which makes it difficult to gather exactly to five inches. I put on a gathering foot and I held the tension with my finger in order to gather up the fabric. It was a bit uneven in places. I later tried out what's called a ruffling foot and that makes really, really beautiful even gathers and ruffles. But you really, in order to get it down to exactly the five inches that I was saying, you would have to test out different settings a few different times with a gathering foot and holding it with my finger that's really imprecise. Maybe with a ruffling foot I know exactly what setting I need to make it exactly the right gathering, but it's definitely much easier on this modern sewing machine where you just set the stitch length to be extra long. On my machine I think it's five millimeters. You sew that one long strip, another one next to it, you gather up the fabric and make it exactly the width that you want it to be before evening out. I think it's called stroking your gathers and then sewing it in place. Maybe it's slightly more sewing steps, but the setup is so much easier and it's so much easier to get exactly the size that you want. So like if you're gathering up your sleeves to fit into the arm side, I think that would be so much easier to do on a modern machine rather than on my antique machine. So for the first time, I think I have to give the modern machine the point on this one because it is much easier to do gathers. Up next, we have hemming and comparing hemming between the two machines. I will admit I didn't know much about hemming feet until I got my 1920s machine that came with all the accessories, including a hemming foot. But my Wilcox and Gibbs machine, I was also able to find hemming feet for that and they are amazing. They turn over your fabric twice so you have a nice beautiful finished edge. I have three hemming feet. One is for really, really narrow hems, which I haven't tried out yet because I'm worried I'm gonna get my fabric stuck in it. So I, I don't know how that works yet. The linen foot, which works amazingly well. And then the wide hemmer, which I love and I think is what sets this antique machine apart. Because with a wide hemmer, you can make a hem of any size and have the machine automatically tuck over the last end and sew it in place for you. So you don't have to be limited by the size of the hemming foot that you bought. You can make it whatever size you want, as wide as you want it, which I really like. For the modern sewing machine, how I had always done hems was ironing it in place and then maybe doing like a blind stitch hem or something like that, but it never really worked out that well for me. It was so frustrating. I didn't realize that they actually made hemming feet for modern sewing machines for rolled hems. I found three different sizes, which is really nice. I think that the setup is okay. I think it requires some practice. The antique machine also required a lot of practice with the hemming feet, so I'd say the setup is nearly the same between the two and you need a little bit of practice to get it right, but they work very well. The only thing is on the modern sewing machines, I just couldn't find a wide hemmer. So one where I could set the hem as wide as I wanted it and automatically have it fold over and sew it for me. And I know it's an accessory and not really the sewing machine itself, but because it just doesn't even exist for the modern machine. By the way, if it does, please let me know. I very much wanted. But I'm the kind of person who really just kind of likes to do it all together in one step if possible, nice and neat, and that's why I think for hemming I'm going to have to give the point to the antique machine over the modern machine. Marking tucks might not seem so important for its own section, maybe for general sewing usage. I don't know how much it's used in modern sewing, but for me personally most of my sewing that I'm doing right now is vintage or antique where tucks and pin tucks are really, really common. For my Victorian walking ensemble for the winter time, I made a lot of pleats and tucks on the skirt portion, and that took me so long. I was so frustrated and pretty demoralized actually by the end of it because with a modern sewing machine, you have to know exactly the measurements of your pleats, do the math to get it three times the width of your pleat, plus the width between that you want your pleats, plus a little bit extra to account for the fabric density that is eaten up by folding over your fabric, then marking it out exactly on your fabric, and then going between your ironing machine and your sewing machine to kind of mark everything and iron it down and sew it in place. And it's just, 
it's a lot of back and forth with a lot of pre-math that really hinders me from actually sitting down and getting started. It's a really big activation energy to get started on making pleats and tucks with my modern sewing machine, so I really don't like to do it. Versus my antique machine, it actually has an own special attachment for a tuck marker. I don't know if you've noticed this, but on this Wilcox and Gibbs machine, most of the attachment aren't on the presser foot, it's actually on the cloth plate. The hemmer and the tuck marker attaches to the cloth plate rather than to the presser foot, which I just thought was really interesting. I had no idea that that's how it could work sometimes, but this one does. What the tuck marker does is you can set the width of your pleats as well as the distance between your pleats and as you sew one of your tucks, the next one will be marked out and creased on your fabric. You can of course then take your fabric to this ironing machine and then iron that crease a little bit harder so it's easier for you to sew the next one. You can just fold it with your hands and run it through the tuck marker again and automatically fold over your next tuck, sew it in place while you're marking the next one. So as I said before, if you can do many things together at once with a nice level of accuracy, then that's the way that I prefer. So obviously for making tucks, I am going to definitely pick the antique sewing machine to get the point and win out this time. The sixth point of comparison, which is halfway through, stick with me a little bit longer, is the power source for your sewing machines. With modern sewing machines, basically your only option is an electric foot pedal. If there's any other modern sewing machines that don't have that, let me know. I've never seen one, that'd be cool. For my antique Wilcox and Gibbs sewing machine, I decided to rebuild this machine as a treadle powered machine. I don't need any electricity for this to work. I just need a good rhythm with my feet in order to power this machine. They also make hand crank models, both the UK and the US version of the hand crank models. And there are other electric versions where you have an electric foot pedal. And there's also some 1920s models of other antique machines that actually use a knee pedal rather than a foot pedal. There are many ways to power your machine. I don't really prefer one over the other. I think for the first time, I'm going to have to make this a tie. I think maybe one point each because both of them work very well. So I'm, I'm happy with both. Speaking of machines looking nice, the next point that is important to me at least is aesthetics. For the modern machine, it's not that it looks bad. I just personally think that it is it's a tool that you use, and if I had a sewing room, maybe I would keep it set up in there all the time so that I could just sit down and start sewing whenever I want to. But because right now I don't, I always pack up my sewing machine whenever I'm not using it so it isn't really looking like a mess in my living area. On the other hand, my antique machine from 1895 is gorgeous. I mean, it was meant to be a furniture piece. At the time, it was incredibly expensive for you know, your average person to buy. So you wanted it to be something that displayed beautifully. I had to restore it back to kind of how it used to look as a treadle machine and it's not exactly 100% the same way, but the details on the iron legs and the foot pedal, the fact that the machine itself makes a G with the head of it, it's a piece that I love to have sitting out and use, just walk up, sit down, and start sewing. It makes it so much easier to start sewing and continue sewing on a project. And yeah, I think you'll see that this is going to another point to the antique machine. The antique machine is currently wiping the floor with a new machine. We're gonna talk about the noise that both of these machines make. I downloaded an app on my phone to figure out how many decibels both of these machines make when they are running. I tried to put the phone as close to the noisiest parts of the machine that I could while it was running and then just really run both of the machines as hard as I could. A little bit of a warning, I'm actually gonna put full volume in of the sewing machines running, so if you don't like that noise, maybe mute it or skip it. <laughs> So looking at the decibel readings that I got for both of the machines as they're running, the modern sewing machine has higher peaks. And on top of that, I personally think that the antique sewing machine has a soothing sound when it runs versus the modern machine is almost jarring in a way. Like I prefer to listening to the old sewing machine rather than the new one. I think it sounds softer. It's actually kind of a funny point. The Wilcox and Gibbs machines, because 
of the way that it was made, the fact that it has one thread and no bobbin, and they really paid attention to the moving parts in the sewing machine and softening and dampening the noise. That was one of the major selling points of the Wilcox and Giz machines is the fact that it'll bring peace and harmony to your home because it is the quietest, most silent sewing machine that you can get. And I think the advertisements can be pretty funny showing like a family in disarray using a competitor sewing machine, which I think you can nearly obviously tell is probably something like a singer versus the family at home using the Wilcox and Gibbs sewing machine where everyone's like peacefully sitting around the living room with someone sewing. I would say I have to agree while it's not much quieter than a sewing machine, I also think that even the sound that it does make is much more soothing than the modern sewing machine. So once again, point to the antique sewing machine. Now, the biggest difference that I think exists between the two machines is your stitch type versatility. Is that something, is that a term? I'm not really sure. Basically the stitch types that you can use. So with the antique machine, like I said, it's a twisted chain stitch, which is just literally one straight stitch and that's it. It works very well. On the other hand, it also means that if you want to sew anything that has a lot of stretch to it, you're going to get some problems because you can only sew a straight line in, for example, stretchy jersey fabric. If you want your fabric to be able to stretch, it won't. And if it does have some stretch tension on it, your threads are most likely going to rip. So it's just not very good at doing different stitch types. She's very good at one thing. <laughs> the modern sewing machine, on the other hand, depending on the machine that you get, has a lot of different options. Usually even the lowest tier sewing machines, you will at least have like a straight stitch and a zigzag stitch. My sewing machine has 99 options of stitch types and I think I've used like maybe three, so I don't know what the other 96 or four, but it is very useful in maybe some more modern sewing. For example, stretchy jersey fabrics, you can use a stitch that's more appropriate for that. That'll actually allow your fabric to stretch while being attached and your thread to not break and it's still to be a good locked in edge. If you're trying to prevent ends from fraying, for example, you can do a zigzag stitch over those, which is much easier to do with a modern sewing machine and pretty much impossible to do with the antique machine. So I'm gonna have to give the point to the new sewing machines with that just because the versatility of your stitches is so much better. The next bit is something that I do pretty frequently. I think everyone does pretty frequently when they're sewing, which is how exactly do you lock your stitches in place when you're starting and ending a particular seam. On the Wilcox and Gibbs sewing machine, this is actually kind of really cool. Because of the twisted chain stitch, you actually don't have to back stitch. So yes, this machine can't go backwards, but at the same time it doesn't need to because you typically only have to go backwards on modern sewing machines to lock your stitches in place. But because of how the twisted chain stitch works, it automatically gets locked into place at the beginning of your row. And then with how you cut, you're sewing at the end and then pull it through a loop it automatically is tied off. You don't have to worry about anything. On the other hand, modern sewing machines requires that you do a few back stitches at the beginning and end of your rows in order to lock your sewing in place, which isn't that much of a hassle. And in modern sewing machines, they easily go backwards. So I guess if you had an antique lock stitch sewing machine, it would be a little bit annoying. Like my 1920s machine doesn't go backwards and is a lock stitch, so I have to do that manually but that's not really a headache on either of my machines. I actually prefer the antique machine when it comes to straight locking because I don't have to remember to go backwards at all. It just is automatically already locked in place. The other thing that's kind of, I don't really know what if I should put it in pro or con for both of them. For the chain stitch sewing that the antique machine does, if you undo the knot at the end of your seam, you are able to unravel your seam in like half a second. It comes apart super easily, which is nice if you are <laughs> like me and often making mistakes in your sewing and need to unpick what you're doing. It is so fast to unpick. On the other hand though, if you accidentally rip a part of your thread, it can mean that your seam can unravel quite easily. So double-edged sword. The modern sewing machine seam that the lock stitch does is harder to unpick. You have to unpick every few stitches because you have to untangle the top and bottom threads, which means that it holds in place better. It's just harder to unpick, which I have to do more often because I make mistakes when I sew, so that annoys me. Antique is better for locking, but modern is better for keeping your seams in place. Antique is better for undoing some seams, but 
the modern make sure that your seams don't come apart quite as easily if you make a mistake in locking your stitch. So for me, this is a bit of a toss up. Let me know if you prefer maybe one over the other, but for me, I'm gonna have to give a point to each because I personally view it as a tie. There's pros and cons to each and neither of them really went out in my opinion. I just find the antique version of the chain stitch really cool. <laughs> Now this part, cost, can be a bit of a delicate subject. I can tell you up front that a modern sewing machine that's more of your average sewing machine, not one of those really professional models, is going to be much more affordable than certain antique machines that you can get, especially the antique Wilcox and Gibbs. If you are super lucky and you happen to live near a Facebook Marketplace seller, that is within driving distance where you can go pick up a machine for like $150, that's amazing, especially if it ends up actually working. But in reality, it's usually much more expensive to buy these Wilcox and Gibbs machines. For me in particular, I didn't have a way of getting to a place or having something shipped to me that was a fully finished version of a treadle cabinet for my sewing machine. So I had to buy all of those parts separately and then assemble them together after refinishing them in order to get a working machine. Cost-wise and time-wise, it was a lot of effort. I'll put in the final price that I ended up paying for all the components together for this sewing machine. For the Wilcox and Gibbs that I have, it is definitely significantly more than the modern sewing machine. Um, so I would say on price, the modern sewing machine wins by far. If you buy the modern sewing machine from a certain online retailer, you can order a sewing machine today and get it in two days from now. I started researching Wilcox and Gibbs sewing machine and the parts three or four months ago, and I started receiving my parts two months ago. And after I was receiving the parts, I then had to refinish some of them because they were in bad shape, I had to fix up others. I wouldn't say it's a negative. I personally loved it. I had such a good time looking at all old diagrams. I looked at patents, but it was a lot of work and it was a lot of time. I did end up documenting the entire process of me refinishing all the different parts for the machines. I tried to strip the legs of all the old paint, making sure, of course, to be super safe. You don't know how many coats of paint were on there or if they contained lead. I did do a lead test to make sure there was no lead and it came back negative, but I still dressed up as if it were the apocalypse, basically, to make sure that I wasn't damaging my lungs because even dust can be really bad for your lungs if you're inhaling it, even if it doesn't have lead in it. I wasn't able to get it fully to the point where I wanted it, so I ended up spray painting the legs reassembling everything back together. I tried to find an appropriate top for the sewing machine to sit on, but I couldn't find an original that was in good enough condition for me to use. So I ended up having a solid wood piece custom made as close as possible to the original tabletop. And then I had to do some measurements to figure out exactly what angle to get the treadle belt holes in. And that was, that was nerve wracking, waiting weeks for a custom piece of wood to come and then drilling holes into it. That was terrifying, but I did it. I wanted some drawers. I couldn't find original Wilcox and Gibbs drawers. So I decided to buy a set of drawers from a different machine, which I actually, I can't figure out what it is. So if you know what drawers this machine belongs to, please tell me because I'm super curious. And then staining and varnishing and all the different steps over a long period of time, which was a lot of fun, but it is a lot of effort. By the way, I have like hours of footage of me restoring and refinishing this sewing machine. I'm gonna put a more detailed video, plus a more detailed video of all the research that I've done on the Wilcox and Ghost machine because it's so cool. You can see all the working pieces. I found patents. I found so many interesting things. I'm gonna put all that together in a much more detailed video on my Patreon. If you'd like to see it, go ahead and head over there. So I think in the general sense, I'm gonna to have to give the point to the modern sewing machine because it is just, well, I mean, you click a few buttons and you have it, or you go to the store and you check out and you have your sewing machine if you want it, which is definitely different from an antique sewing machine like the one that I have. Comparing the antique sewing machine to the new sewing machine, while it did end up being close, or at least closer than I thought it would be, the antique sewing machine wins out for me personally. I think it's gonna be my main sewing machine from now on, especially because I like to sew antique pieces. So it adds that like extra special touch of making, for example, the 1890s Victorian wrapper on an 1890s machine. How cool is that? What do you guys think? Are there any categories that you would have considered that I didn't, or would you have given points to the other machine where I would have? I am also really interested to hear what you all think. This has been a long time in the making. It's taken me so long 
long to get here. I was actually really nervous to do this just because so much effort has been put into it. But I'm so happy to share it with you all. And I hope that I'll see you again really soon. I am working on my wrap corset next. I did a whole nother <laughs> renovation setup in order to make that one work. So I can't wait to share that one with you all as well. So yeah, I'll be making an 1890s wrap corset using an 1890s sewing machine and I can't wait. So I'll see you all again so soon. <laughs>